welcome everyone to Stand Up and Stand Out. I'm excited to introduce our next guest, Loretta Vaney, who is one of my fellow speakers and does inspirational speaking for caregivers. Welcome, Loretta. I'm so excited to have you here today. Hi, you, Nikki. I'm thrilled to be here. I have a couple of questions I like to ask our guests to get to know them a little bit more, understand yes. what they do. And my audience is a lot of them are quite young and they're still trying to figure out what to do with their careers. And I think it's important to show the variety of things that people do <laughs> and that you experience a lot of stuff in your life and that you it's do. not always the thing you start with <laughs> that gets you to the finish. So, How um, true is that? So before we get to where you're at, why don't we start with what's your origin story? So every great superhero or villain <laughs> has one. Tell us a little bit about yours. So the origin story, if I did the career part, <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll go, I'll go back. So one of the cool things about me, my origin story, I was born at home. Not many people can say that. My mother thought she had indigestion and by the time she realized it was not indigestion I was out how cool is that and so <laughs> only people there were my mom and my dad so that's pretty cool being delivered by your dad and I was born in a blizzard which also meant they couldn't take me to the hospital because they couldn't get out so all kinds of things so the doctor just said count your fingers and toes and it seemed like I had everything and so that was pretty cool my sister was nine and a half almost ten when I was born so I clearly was one of those accidental kind of things and uh, so not only an accident, but born at home, too. So kind of funny. And then a few days later, when the snowstorm was over, my dad went to the store to get bread and milk and whatever and never came back. So my first career, I was a private investigator. So I did that and eventually found my father so my parents could get a divorce. Very interesting. And so that spurred my first little career. So my master's degree is in forensic science. So a whole lot of stuff on TV, you know, the whole crime scene, you know, <laughs> CSI and all the stuff that people grew up on. And uh, so that was really exciting. And uh, I never wanted to work in a lab, but I did want to do the investigations and, you know, and things like that. I wasn't that great at the measurement scientific part, but it was great. The investigation piece of it was great. And that really gives you, um, uh, preparation to work really in any industry because it's all about getting to know each other and it's true there's some deceit to it because when you're trying to investigate and get things you do have to tell some lies and things like that <laughs> pretending somebody that you're not but it does give you a window into people's characteristics um, some of the things you aspire to some of the things you definitely want to stay away from so it was a really good, you know, the nicest people who were embezzling, who were, you know, cheating on their spouses. I mean, I've seen people have sex in every possible location, including one on Skyline Drive in Virginia, which is, they have these horrific little, little overlooks. And the guy that was with me was holding my feet. And I'm with this video can of literally hanging over the side of a mountain videotaping this couple. It's staring. And they never, of course, as dark as I am, they couldn't say, so there are, there are some things <laughs> videotaping people at night and my hair was not white at the time so that would have been a clear giveaway but you really do learn a lot about people and it did it taught me a lot about life you know as a 21 year old I think you I really did learn a lot of lessons about what not to do you know, if you wanted to be successful because yeah there were some people who were cheating at different things and had great success but in the end you know they get caught which is why we were investigating in the first place so you do learn that people can be successful by doing things correctly. So I think the investigating piece really taught me a lot. That's great. And I think it's sort of learning how to read people, learning the lines, and it sort of kept you on the hero's path and you saw the villains. And you yes. Saw them. yes, firsthand. Yes. Lots of all of them in some cases. Which, yeah, it was probably more than I had anticipated, but you know. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. Well, that's already a pretty good story, but let's talk about what else makes you unique and what makes you stand out about, you know, sort of the rest of your journey throughout your, your time on the earth. Yeah, that's a, that's really a cool question too. And I, I think for me, uh, the fact that, you know, I tell people a lot of times I phrase it differently, but you know, I'm sort of a Lego instructor. I'm a, a what they call an A fall, which is an adult fan of Lego. And there are lots of the thousands of us out there. That is a real term. Yes. Yeah, see, well, thank you for your shirt, girl. I almost wore mine. But yes, I have zillions of the, the Lego t-shirts, but in, you know, in all seriousness, I facilitate something called Lego serious play 
and it's fun. It's Lego bricks, yes, but it also is a methodology to help people communicate more effectively. So, and especially those of us who work alone a lot, you know, and people have been working at home, it gives people the opportunity whenever they do get back to their own work buildings that they used to work in. Now you you not have to communicate. There's some teddy bears over here. So you maybe you talk to the bears or something, but really, unless you're on Zoom, you're not really talking to other people. But one of the things Lego Serious Play does is help people, um, you know, resolve issues, you know, solve problems, or strategize. It really is something. And you do that through these models that you build. So a facilitator's job is to ask a question and everybody builds based on that question, build a bridge or a tower or whatever the strategic plan thing is you're working on. And then everybody shares what they built. And that's the beauty of it because everybody is equal in that room. You know how you go to a meeting and two, two or three people talk and the rest of the people don't say a word? Yeah. And titles are very important. Well, in Lego series play, titles don't mean a thing. So I've been in a room with the CEO all the way down to the janitorial staff, the cafeteria workers, the coffee cart person, you know, everybody in the same room and everybody's equal. So your title, you know, it doesn't mean anything if it's not in your model. So all, all personalities are aside. So even if people don't like each other, they're still listening. And then as a facilitator, if I'm holding up my little model and a person next to me says, oh, I didn't like what you said in the meeting last week. Well, my job is then to say, where is that in the model? You can ask a question, but it must be about the little Lego thing and not about that. And so at the end of the session, you've heard all these amazing ideas because I've been in the room where the CEO says, Margaret, I didn't know you felt that way or had that idea. And like Margaret's been working there for 10 years, but they've never had a conversation. It's funny how you, you talk and become comfortable talking over a toy in essence. Yeah. But it, it just brings out amazing things. And people, sometimes it's very emotional, especially if they've gone through some sort of trauma or there's been a layoff or there's a new CEO and he wants to get to know everybody. It can be very um, emotional, but it also is a ton of fun. So when you tell people you're like a Lego instructor, people kind of go, huh? <laughs> but it's been amazing. I'm proud of the groups I've worked with, you know, the, some of the corporations, Verizon, United Way, some of those folks, and all, that's all wonderful, but my greatest joy, and I think what really makes me unique uh, in terms of the Lego, is because my mom has Alzheimer's, I had a ton of success with my mother in Lego bricks, so because even though she hasn't known me for seven years, she still must, somewhere in her brain, remember the hours and hours of Lego building we did years ago when I was a child, so it had such an impact on her. She would just come alive whenever I got the Legos out. She would build, you know, I don't know if you know, um, Alzheimer's patients typically will say, um, I want to go home. And that's right. because they're remembering going backwards to whatever year they were Someplace going. Someplace previously, wherever they got. Yeah. I bought her a lot of Lego doors and windows. This is oh, one of the first that. house. She, this is the one she built in 2014. And I saved it and it used to have a little Lego person in it with gray hair. <laughs> <laughs> And so she would look at it and say, I'm still in there. So it was really cool. And, um, but it, it made such a difference in her. I thought, I wonder if other people would react like that. So I started doing sort of Lego art because they can't really build to the questions you do. You might say, build your favorite memory and they might be able to do that. But if they're in the middle to late stages, my mother's in the late stages. But so if you're in that, you can't build to a question. I just throw the bricks out there and like, let's do some art. And they're like, okay. And they just- Yeah, and start throwing the colors and the shapes things. together. Yeah. And that's been one of my greatest joys because we don't have to talk. You know, we don't have to share. I'm not trying to get them to do something they don't want to do. You know, a lot of times when they see people, somebody's trying to force them to eat or force them to take a bath or whatever it is. But I'm just there to have fun. Yeah. And I think just watching, if I can show you, you know, pictures, there's some pictures on my website of just the biggest smiles you could ever see. And it is it just, it's amazing. So that's kind of one of the. I, I think, love it. it it's so important. <laughs> and, and a mother of a close friend of mine, had similar, you know, challenges with the Alzheimer's. And it's so tough because you lose that connection, that ability yeah. to communicate, that thing that has kept you together for so long. Yeah. And it is, it becomes those challenging conversations of, again, like feeding and, and other yeah. things. And it's like, okay, can we just change the conversation so we can just yeah. relate together again and, and just have a good time, right? And, and, that's and remember really, some of that. So that's, really that's fantastic. Really. I love it. Well, <laughs> that, that already was quite the dichotomy, but I'm sure it in was. your lifetime- <laughs> You've explored even more careers besides that. So what other exciting things have you filled your life with? 
my investigations career turned into in front of a corporate security job. And that's a really interesting, you know, sort of segue for women, especially, you know, most corporate security folks, you know, like head of the head of security for the NFL, the NBA, uh, the WNBA has a female um, you know, corporate security person. And your job really is not only to protect the assets, you know, the computers or whatever they have in it, but, you know, your number one priority is people. So um, I became a trainer in the security industry responsible for training both uh, the uniform people you see in the malls and that kind of thing. But also I've worked with a lot of uh, law enforcement. I taught for quite a while at the, um, there's a huge uh, federal law enforcement training center in uh, Georgia and one here in the DC area. And um, almost all of the alphabet soups as we like to call them train there. So it was fun doing you know, a variety of courses for them. Some of them really hands-on, some self-defense things and things like that. Physical security, I taught that for a while where they learned about the operations and working of alarms and alarm systems. Because if you're in law enforcement, you don't know how things work. You just say stop and people stop. Some of those things that if they're transitioning from a law enforcement career to a security career, those two things, they sound alike, but they're quite different. Mm -hmm. So uh, for a while, I taught a course specifically for law enforcement people who are retiring to let you know what to expect in the corporate world, because it's much different. In the police department, you say, you know, stop right here because I said so. And if you say that in the corporate world, today's probably your last day. So... (laughs) So it's I a little different. How to make that transition, you want people to follow your instructions, but it's all in how you say it. And it's not the easiest transition that you think. So that was a fun thing to do. My husband was a um, you know, retired DC cop. We were together for the second half of his career. I met him, he had like 10 years on, he did 23. So I did, and he was canine. So we had dog and the dog training and all that. So yeah, really cool stuff. And it was Fun to me, but much safer for me as a trainer, much safer for me as um, a trainer. I did go to some dangerous things. I've been to prisons, of course. I've done a lot of trainings in federal prison. Uh, And some of the federal prisons uh, in particular, uh, they make the inmates do uh, training. So if you were a lawyer and you got to, you had to teach something, and if you were accountant, you taught math, you know, you were a bezler and whatever. So they they put their folks to work. So I did a lot of uh, presentation techniques for inmates nice. <laughs> who were being turned into teachers. So I've been locked in federal prison um, for a few days at a time. It's been cool. I've done some stuff um, on the border, making some training tapes about how to stay safe from you know, the different weapons they get off of people, you know, crossing into the United States. Um, I do, you know, how to do, you know, the pat downs. And you know, a lot of people are shy about that, but you can't be shy. It means you, your life is going to depend on it. So I made a a series of videotapes. Most of my 35 year security career has been in the training endeavor. So that way, which has been really cool for me, you meet a lot of people across a lot of different, you know, spectrums. I've worked with the highest security person, you know, in a corporation, you know, all the way down to folks who, you know, ride around in little scooters and parking lots and they need training too. And so we worked on, you know, customer service skills and and those kind of things. When you're meeting people, there are ways to talk to people and get them to follow the direction you're trying to provide. But there's also a way to do that. So I've done a lot of prep for um, the the Atlanta Olympics and uh, a couple of Olympics in the States where you train people to do the wand with the metal detectors and things like that. So I've done some big events too, a couple of inaugural balls here in the DC area we yeah. worked with a variety of, of security folks. So it's been quite the 35 years. I'm actually uh, going to be leaving that in, you know, over the summer, and I'm just going to do the speaking and Lego building full time. I'm really looking forward to that. That's fantastic. And I think you have such a joy in your personality and you connect with people. And I think that is so important. No matter what career choice we have, you can take skills and you can keep sort of building on them if you can learn to, again, read people, communicate with them and bridge those gaps. Oh, so that is a next. really important. I've been on the, a workplace violence prevention committee for four years. And one of the reasons I'm on that is I, I do indeed think my personality kind of diffused quite a few situations mm-hmm. where, you know, a lot of times in workplace violence, people don't notify you until the person that's going to hurt them shows up. 
you know, because I don't want people to know your business. But then, you know, especially it was in this case, it was a husband and wife who worked in the same place, different buildings. And he basically said, I'm on my way to kill you. And now she decides to say they've been having problems, you know, for years. And now, oh, and by the way, he's by, his, he's on his way and he has a badge. And it's hard for people to quickly turn that shift of like, yes. oh, he's not a good guy. I should help yes. you out with this because they haven't yes. yeah, been reporting along the way, right? So, I, you know, I, I have prided myself on being able to kind of talk people down as as they say, but, you know, it could, it could end, you know, really badly for, you know, for that. So I've, I've really think I've done some good in that area, but you do need a certain personality to be able to uh, talk a person out of something that they're uh, really set on doing. And so yeah. that's um, it, you know, kind of a tough. hard thing. It's really tough. Uh, they always call mine the laugh heard around the office because no matter how how bad yeah. or stressful things are, I'm always sort of laughing and cracking jokes in between stuff to, to just, again, diffuse the situation a bit, yeah. you know, because it's yeah. easy to get your passions involved and, and it, it kind of goes negative and you don't mean to. It's and so especially true. in a corporate environment, too, where you're not supposed to be, you're supposed to always be somewhat even tempered. It's it's not always the easiest thing to do when, when you're really passionate true. about your work. Right. Mm -hmm. So. Well, speaking about passion of your work, uh, we've talked about Legos, but uh, what is your passion, either personal or professional? And what are you currently doing to transition? You said you're going to retire from the security biz and on to the next thing. So. You know, my passion is really has become the seniors because my mom is 92. So I'm really, you know, passionate about that. But I have this really you know, sort of unique uh, blend of pure passion and enjoy and energy to go along with it. People are like, wow, she liked this all the time. <laughs> that used yeah. to be the number one question my husband would get. You know, is she like that all the time? He's like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And how do you keep up with that? He used to always say, I used to just grab on the back of her shirt and just follow her wherever she went. And that was the easiest way to keep up with me. So it was a pretty honest answer too. I love it. But yeah, I think that really does make me, you know, stand out because as you already pointed out with your friend's example, you know, dementia in particular, I mean, there's not one funny thing about that. However, if you don't bring some humor to it, I mean, my mother used to say the funniest thing and you would just fall out on the floor mm -hmm. laughing. I thought I was doing something. You know, my mother, when we were little, she used to put us in all these camps and everything, you know, to enrich us. So yeah, I'm like, okay. So when she, you know, got the dementia, I said, okay, well, I'll do some adult daycare so she at least could be with other people and the minimum was like three hundred dollars i mean uh three days a week and it was really expensive yeah. and so and the minimum was like three days i'm like oh lord i'm gonna go broke so i did that because she had done so much for us one day they called me at work and said she refused to get on the bus and i'm, trying, I'm like what so i i'm like okay we'll just tell the bus to go ahead you know so i got off of work i went over i said so what happened you didn't want to go to daycare no I was like, well, you don't like it. No, I mean, she hated it. And then, you know, so we get to the bottom of what the reason is. She, my yeah. mother's a big reader. She would always want to just sit in the corner, and read her book. But their job at those adults, they get, they get money based on how many activities you participate in. What she want to do with the activities. So she She's was- like, My reading. activity is reading. Like, yeah. let me go. <laughs> That's enough to be a little thing, you know, so they were not happy with her. Well, you don't have to go back. I don't want to go back. Oh, okay. Well, I said, then we can, you know, save the money. It's not free. No, girl, it's not free. <laughs> so it was so funny. And then after we decided she's not going back, she said, and I don't know what you were thinking anyway. I'm way too old for daycare. And I fell on the, I fell on the floor. Uh, she, <laughs> it's, she, and, you know, it's just that aha moment, you know, literally I'm way too old for daycare. She was so mad at me. You really think you're doing something, but you don't always know best. So that's kind of cool. I think part of this journey is really, you know, just being able to laugh at yourself. Yeah. You know, and it was a very expensive lesson to learn. She didn't last a month, I don't think. Really, I think it's our, you know, joy. People who see us together, and we were always laughing, sometimes at absolutely nothing. But I think that has gotten us through so many things. And then other families see us or see that or listen to my presentation. They kind of go, wow, she's amazing. I get the question a lot. Was I before this a stand-up comedian? And that was one of the things I have not done, but I'm pretty good at telling the story. Like, are you stand-up comedian? I'm like, no, no, I have not. But I, I can tell a story and make you fall right on the floor. It really does get you through the bad days. So that, you know, yeah. this is a good transition for me. Because I, you know, I've also laughed doing the security thing, but there have been a lot more emotional days. I think it's a very stressful thing right. um, to do that, you know, kind of day in, day out for years because you see, uh, you try to make things, you know, joyful or at least bearable, but you're seeing the worst of the worst of people in that 
setting. So I think this is a great balance and a great transition for me, something that I love, love, love. And I've done a fairly good job. I've, I've been speaking since 2014 about this and I've done a really good job, I believe. I've gotten awards at work and everything. And they let me travel all around and come back and make up time. They've been just I love incredibly it. supportive of me, but almost everybody in the chain that I report to has either a sibling or a parent or in-law that has dementia. So they, you know, when I was in the New York Times, everybody in the building was running around with their copy and one of the signatures. It was crazy good. Yeah. And they have just really supported me. But I just think it's time to just kind of have some fun. And, and since I do love this so much now, I won't have to, if you will, split my loyalty. Yeah, between, between the two. Between the two. I, yeah, so, the beauty of virtual now, we have a lot more flexibility yeah. <laughs> yeah. in doing it all. Yes. And, and I think that is a bit of the way of things of the future is I think, mm-hmm you know, especially when we start, we're always trying to get a job and you're trying to pay the bills and you need benefits and you need some of these basics, but there's Mm -hmm. so much talk now about the side hustle or, you know, your passion projects and things like that. I do think this next generation is going to have a very different work experience than they've ever had before, where they Mm -hmm. may be juggling these things, even from the very beginning of their career, because you never know where these passions might lead in the future. So you might as well do something fun that can you you know, some more energy, maybe not always money in the beginning, but you know, That's you start so to turn true. that around, right? <laughs> I was building little Lego to- fidget toys and selling them on Etsy and things like, who do you'd be doing that? But people, <laughs> stuff I thought I was doing just to entertain my mom, somebody would see me in the doctor's office and say, oh, where'd you get that? Oh, I made this. Oh, can you make me one? <laughs> Here's my card. Like, yeah, okay, I guess so. <laughs> Wasn't in my plan for today, but I guess I can do that. Yeah. So. Making friends everywhere you go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, to close us off, last big question is you're doing a lot of amazing things, um, but what makes you stand up? What causes have affected your life that really make you want to improve them for future generations? I think a lot of us have these passions. That's part of what drives us. Um, but sometimes for us, there may be one particular one over others. So, yeah, I think. You know, I'm hoping, I don't, I'm not sure it'll work out. My thing was, uh, I had hoped we'd find a cure for Alzheimer's, you know, by now. So that's my big thing. I've had others, you know, sort of along the way, you know, my sister died of MS. And so I did um, the MS marathons for her for about eight years from the time she was diagnosed to the year or two after she died. I think the things that happen to our life, that's the thing about passion. I think the things that you, you know, center around, you know, may change over time but i think my you know overall passion through all of these kinds of different conditions and all that is that i really want to stand up for other people and so i I think i'm a fierce advocate not only you know just for my mother but for a lot of folks who don't have somebody to advocate for them you know african americans are you know really disproportionately impacted by alzheimer's and they can't always get the care my mother's very fortunate She had a federal job, so she has lifelong Blue Cross insurance, and not everybody does that. So, you know, she's in a great position, but I've met just as many people who have nothing. So I, you know, I'll get on the phone and try to advocate for them and get things. And so I want everybody to have, you know, I I know we're not all going to be always equal. You know, some people are always going to have a lot of money and some people are not. Um, But I at least want to make the treatment parts of it and services that are available to to everybody. So I think that's my overall thing. You really want everybody to have sort of a fair shake, you know, if you will, in terms of services. I I hate when you read or see, even just today I saw it, where a lady was rationing her uh, insulin, choosing between that and food. And, you know, you're like, what? And because she makes minimum wage and all this stuff. So, yeah, I know they're just such that story. And there's zillions of stories like that. So I think when I get up and speak, I'm not just telling the story of my mother. I'm encouraging other people to get out and fight for your loved one. This is my mother. I, you know, I would, you know, knock anybody down to, to do whatever I need to do for her. But you also want to inspire other people to do that because, you know, the third time you call the doctor and you're trying to get this medicine or whatever it is, then you just give up. I don't want you to give up. I want you to keep fighting for that, whatever it is. Obviously they need it, whatever it is. And so I want to just continue to inspire people. Don't give up. That's why my motto really is, you know, I move people, caregivers from I give up to I got this. I want people to walk away from whatever thing they're at to really believe that they can accomplish whatever it is they're trying to do in caregiving. And that's my thing. 
That, that's fantastic. And, and I, I think I, I say the same thing too, you know, in my book, even um, I'm not telling my story to compete or that there's, you right. know, this sort of scarcity mentality. Yeah. I'm telling my story to encourage other people to tell theirs. It's important that we keep telling the story and that we advocate for others who maybe aren't comfortable or aren't ready to tell their own. Right. And I think the more we share, the more they're comfortable Right. And my sister yes. had multiple sclerosis. So, you know, I am definitely compassionate about that. I've done many events, cycling events, hundreds yeah. of yeah. events to, again, help raise money for those things. And I think those ongoing things are important. And through your speaking business and just your amazing personality, uh, <laughs> I know you're going to continue to inspire people. I and a little Lego thing. Alzheimer's fundraiser called The Longest Day. I built a three foot tall mountain and then had all these little Lego people climbing to the top to find a cure for Alzheimer's. So uh, we had people building from all over the world. I think the person who was the furthest, it was supposed to be at my church, you know, in person before COVID, it worked out even better because when we had to do it virtually, that meant people could build from everywhere. So somebody from Germany sent them. So that was my furthest away person, but we had people from all over the world participate. That was really cool. So I'm doing Legos again this year. So we'll see how it plays out. But like you say, you never know how many people are touched by what you're doing until you put it out there and say, hey, I'm building that. And little teeny kids were building little things. And it was so cool. There's no age limit for inspiring people to do things. So, you know, no Love minimum it. or no limit. That's going to be my thing. I don't look at it so much as I'm sort of walking away from the security thing. While I still have a lot of energy left, I want to give it to this, you know, other thing full time and just be committed to it. So uh, I think it's really going to be exciting. Oh, fantastic. I'm so excited for you, Loretta. I'm so glad that you were able to come join us on our podcast. We'll have to do another live one with some Legos and we'll do We some will. Because, you know, you know, I'm going to need your help when I do the, I'm trying to still do the timing and the techniques of, I want to give out some little uh, bags of three or four bricks I'm playing between the numbers and, you know, incorporate it into one of my keynotes. And, fantastic. Uh, so we'll, so we'll see. I'm always the hostess, so I'm happy to have yes. any events, <laughs> virtual, in person, any hybrid, whatever's going on. And we um, appreciate you, and thank you for all you do, too. This is awesome. Oh, it's going to be amazing. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Loretta. And oh, thank I you for having me. Well, that's all for today's episode of Stand Up and Stand Out. You can find out more about Loretta at her website at LorettaVaney.com. Find out more about her Lego-themed events for caregivers and how she moves caregivers from I give up to I've got this. More information is also available on our website and in the show notes at greenchameleoncollective.com forward slash podcast. See you next time.